I want to welcome our two uh, conversationalists for the next talk on stage. So um, they're going to do a more broader introduction about themselves, but I just want to share that both uh, Ted Person um, and, and, and uh, Simon are fantastic. Simon Strand are fantastic people. I had a lot of conversation with them. Ted used to be a very successful entrepreneur, and now he's giving money of his uh, venture fund away. So I think they're definitely very good people to know. So you like, need to impress them that he gives you his money. Um, so I think please um, really pay attention to what they're saying. It's fantastic that you're coming again to Cluj. So I think he has been, he's been very supportive of the ecosystem. So I really appreciate that. Please give them a big round of applause. And welcome them on stage. Thank you so much. Yeah, so my name is, uh, is Ted Person. Um, I used to be uh, an entrepreneur. Um, let's see here if we can get the, um, the slides up before us starting to uh, present. Exactly. Um, I used to be an, um, an entrepreneur, now I'm um, an investor I'm based in Stockholm, and I work for an investment firm called um, EQT Ventures. And EQT Ventures is um, one of the larger VC firms in, uh, in Europe. We are uh, investing in A rounds, B rounds, and, uh, and C rounds. Um, and here I have an old friend of mine, uh, Simon. Who are you? Hi, so my name is Simon Strand, and I'm uh, I've been working as a PR consultant for the last 10 years before quitting right before Christmas uh, and now I'm inventing my new job and doing strategy consulting in parallel. So my background uh, is from first Prime Weber Shandwick where I worked uh, until 2011 and then I started working, I co-founded a PR boutique firm called 500 uh, three years ago, uh, which I quit. Then we worked with brand positioning, crisis communications, and one of the uh, tech companies that I worked with in recent times is Enride, which is an autonomous truck company. Uh, actually, the first of all the com uh, competitors in that market to enter public roads uh, internationally, uh, which, among other uh, media outlets CNN covered recently. This was in May. Um, so, yeah. Uh. Cool. And we figured we would innovate a bit on the actual format here. So, uh, what you will see here for the next 16 minutes and 24 seconds we see here will not be a presentation and it will not be a panel, but a combination. And we call it uh, a pretzel. So, it's half presentation, half, uh, half panel. And this is how it works. We'll start with Simon doing a, a presentation, and then we will discuss that as a panel. Then I will do a presentation, and then we'll do a quick panel about that. And then we'll open up for questions if we have more time, and all of this in just 15 minutes and uh, 58 seconds. So let's get going. Simon. So uh, I have uh, tried to identify using my uh, long experience from PR, what are the most common de denominators for startups to do wrong when they communicate their own brands. And the first uh, and perhaps uh, most usual uh, fault that startup brands does is failing to describe how their uh, business idea is tapping into a broader change. I uh, read TechCrunch this morning and found an article about Lilium, which is a quite, still quite small uh, and quite fresh startup out of southern Germany. Uh, it's uh, an air tax taxi company, um, and they are a great example of putting their own idea into context. Uh, just look at the two first paragraphs of the article. Uh, this morning, as I said, uh, and you find, if you look at the, the sentences here, you, you can find uh, numerous uh, uh, broad changes that their story connects to. One of them is Brexit and the friction between different Euro European countries. They're talking about uh, the, the job market and how they are contributing to uh, adding new jobs in UK in a time when that most jobs goes uh, away from the UK, and uh, they're, they also have a touch point against towards electrification uh, and the future of transport and the sharing economy. So just in this very dense text, they managed to put their story into five different contexts that 
makes their brand more relevant in a broader uh, space than they would have if they failed to do that. At the same time, uh, there are many examples of when startups try to connect to a context where they actually don't belong. Uh, a few months ago, I read this article, I think it was on Slashdot, uh, about that 45% of startups that claim to do AI aren't actually working with artificial intelligence. So, of course, for many people that aren't that don't uh, have deep knowledge themselves, it can be hard to, to separate those that are really into what they claim to be and those who aren't. But uh, it's not only about contextualizing um, your brand, but also to substantialize the context you're claiming to work within. Um, another, uh, another very crucial and uh, a, a crucial uh, point to this is that many many brands can't uh, many many brands uh, are uninteresting at their core, and thus you can't solve it by communication. But you would have to go back uh, to how you work with the product and how you tell that story. One example: Google. Uh, they had 99% of their revenue from Google Ads, or as it was previously called, Google AdWords. But at the same time, 99% of the coverage or the attention comes from these edgy innovation ideas like uh, the Google self-driving cars or the Google Glasses. The Google Glasses 2.0 was launched, I think it was last week. Um, and one third example of what most startups does wrong is to communicate in one-offs rather than in teams. It's better to try to find like one, two, three messages and tell them in 10 different ways than the other way around. Uh, one company that does this very, very well, uh, I think is Netflix and how they work with uh, communicating their culture. So that was my three uh, takeaways about what most startups get wrong. So that was your presentation. Now let's move into panel mode for 45 seconds. So quick turns in this, uh, in this presentation, or in this pretzel. So these were your three points. So um, my first question would be around the first point, fail failing to describe how their idea is driving or tapping into broader change. So I, I was watching this, um, this TEDx presentation, I think, 10 years ago uh, from this guy, Simon Sinek. And he talks about that you should start with why and having a higher cost. Is, is that one of the solutions or? Yes, it is. Well, I haven't seen the TED Talk, but I think I'm quite familiar with uh, the, the basis of his ideas because it's, it's about uh, instead of focusing on the process and what you're doing and how you're doing it, you're starting with your purpose. And uh, I would say that that's uh, uh, something that's very crucial, and even more so these days than before if you're going to build a strong brand. Uh, so definitely, yeah. Which I guess is easier for, for startups, since they're usually founder-led. It's the, the higher vision or the purpose is almost like built into the, the founder and the founder's narrative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. And on, on the second point here, making an, an interesting product or building an, an interesting company, what's, what's the, uh, the most uninteresting startup you've ever come across? <laughs> well, that's a funny question because it's like uh, asking me to remind the most forgettable idea I can think of. Uh, but I've come across many strange ones that are a bit far-fetched, perhaps. I have a friend who used to work for what he called Tinder for Growl. For? <laughs> for gravel, like ah. small rocks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was some kind of business to business marketplace for matching uh, sellers of gravel with buyers. <laughs> I think it sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, so, so that was actually not the answer to, to the question because I can't come to think of the most uninteresting one since that's also the most forgettable ones. <laughs> Got it. So now it's, now it's my turn to, to do a quick presentation and then we discuss that. So my part here is called uh, embracing irrationality. And I, I'd like to talk about the brain. 
And I think we're doing our best to, uh, to be rational, but I think at least to me it's very clear that the emotions are in control. So if you think about the brain as a product, it's a pretty uh, buggy product. It's almost as if the um, designers of the brain, I guess, evolution itself, was following Reid Hoffman's motto of uh, um, ship fast, and that you have to be embarrassed about your first, uh, first product. So I think these bugs we have in our brains, um, the uh, cognitive biases, uh, can be exploited for uh, marketing and product design and so forth. So I think this Wikipedia article about the cognitive biases, it's one of my favorite places to go and just there's just keeps on keeps on giving. And I'd just like to highlight three cognitive biases that I think are important uh, from a marketing and, and product design perspective. And the first one here is the fact that we see stories everywhere, even if there is no story. And I think it's pretty clear that we are social storytelling animals, we as human beings. There is even research suggesting that uh, language itself emerged as a way for us to tell stories about one another, almost as a peer validation uh, system. And in this day and age, I think it's pretty evident that stories beat facts. And I think for you guys as uh, startup founders, I think you should take this to you and exploit this and think about what stories you can, you can create. So then the next step is, okay, how do I craft this story? And then there is another cognitive bias that could give us some some guidance. Uh, this one here, the fact that we're favoring simple-looking options, so in a way, less is, less is more. And I just stumbled upon this. I don't know how many of you here remember the Zune. It was Microsoft's attempt to create an iPod a long time ago. And this was one of the, their, uh, their launch ads, filled with all the features and all the complexity. And at the same time, Apple did this. Uh, very straightforward, very storytelling-driven, and way easier to, uh, to relate to because of its uh, simplicity. So, my advice would be start simple, but then add something bizarre, funny, or visually striking to the, to the story. And I think this is where a lot of very rationally driven engineering-led founders and companies go a bit wrong, because you want to tell all the facts, but I think just adding that weird or bizarre thing makes all, all the difference. This is John Medina. He's a brain researcher and also the author to a book called Brain Rules, and he tells us that emotionally charged events persist way longer in our memories and are way better to, to, uh, to recall than boring or neutral memories. And the best brands out there know this. So if you look at Apple's legendary Think Different campaign, for instance, it's wrong. It's, it's, the grammar is wrong. It should have been Think Differently. So just the fact that there is something wrong or off makes this way more interesting. It sticks in your brain. The same thing with Adidas, impossible is nothing. I mean, no one would ever say that. Impossible is, uh, is nothing. And I think that uh, when in tra more traditional communication, when the products are undifferentiated, when the products are almost the same, like, like cars, it's kind of like the same cars in different, different shells or different chassis, uh, the branding is how we differentiate, or the marketing is how we differentiate. But in startups, when you have a differentiated product, I mean, the product in itself is very disruptive. We see in many cases that in terms of communication and branding, you kind of want to belong to a category because you want the potential customers to be able to hang this on a mental, in a mental hook. So I, I think that's why in 2016, every software as a service website looked like Intercom. And nowadays, every software as a service website looks like, like Stripe. So from my perspective, and, and, yeah, and, and looking at Bootstrap, frameworks like Bootstrap, like everything nowadays looks kind of, kind of the same. So I think as a startup founder, I think we maybe should learn a bit more from the past and how branding used to be done and maybe dare to find your, your own voice and maybe go from trying to belong to a category too much and maybe find an artful, artful balance there. Uh, so that was the, um, the next one. And uh, just talking about being bizarre or funny or visually striking, so I'm sure that not many of you right now remember my name, but if I show you this picture and then I add this bear, and then I throw in Ted Danson into the mix. Now you remember that my name is Ted. So that's like a proof of this whole, this whole part. Um, those were a couple of three uh, cognitive biases. There are many, many more. There's the baby face bias that we tend to like baby faces, like GitHub, for instance. There's the uh, archetypical startup story of David versus Goliath, the underdog bias. There's expert consultant bias. Yeah, there, there are so many, many of these various uh, biases to, uh, to have a look at. So uh, with that, panel. 
Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions to you as well. The first one being, you showed a lot of examples from blue chip companies uh, using communication to differentiate their brand. Uh, can you mention uh, any like newer but familiar companies that are also good at embracing irrationality? I, I think the company that, that you highlighted, I mean, both Lilium and Einride, I mean, they're very, very young companies. They've like baked the whole storytelling into their product in a way. It's very visually striking. But if you're talking about more mature companies, I would say, I mean, Airbnb, I think it's a great example. So companies that, that maybe are not just engineering-led, but also design or, or communication-led as well. Uh, many of the people I met here uh, are uh, Romanian founders looking to export their product or their services. Um, what would be like, what's your take on how to brand Romania abroad from an uh, irrationality embracing perspective? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I think when I went here for the first time last year, it was, it was so much more than I was expecting. I think Romania is like grouped into sort of Eastern Europe in, in, in the minds of most people who don't come from this region. So maybe build on that and then, and then just highlight the uh, breadth and depth uh, that exists in this region. So maybe yeah, if it's Transylvania, all the Dracula stuff, maybe that's good, but then you have to make something more out of it. I don't, I don't know. Okay, can I also, by the way, plug three books that I think people should read? Sure. So these are three books that I think um, any, any founder is interested in this should, should read. It's, uh, the first one is called Designing for Emotion. It's only 60 pages or so. It's, it's about how to use these cognitive biases to design better products. And then it's Win Bigly by the, uh, the founder and, and creator of Dilbert. And he's, he's talking about how um, Donald Trump uh, ended up in, in office. And then the third one is my top favorite like, sales book, how to make people uh, say yes. I came to think of Win Bigly, the title, it's a bit like those slogans you mentioned as well with the weird It's twist. weird, yeah, Bigly. And I think D Donald Trump actually, I don't know if it's deliberate, but he's kind of like the master of weirdness <laughs> in, in, in communication. So with that being said, um, that was our uh, pretzel. I don't know if there are any people in the, in the audience who have any questions or comments. We have a whopping one minute and 30 seconds left on our... Uh, our slot. We want at least one question, otherwise we won't leave the stage. One question. What product are you the proudest of? Was that the question? Um, so from, from my perspective, um, I've done three startups. Um, the first one was a, a company called Blocket, which uh, later became kind of like eBay of Europe based out of out of Sweden. I'm not very proud of that because looking at the designs I did back in the late 90s, they look yeah, pretty much like crap. Uh, but I don't know, I've, I've also worked as a, as a, as a consultant. I, I founded an agency and did a lot of work for H&M and for, um, yeah, maybe when I was part of designing the, one of the first e-commerce platforms of H&M, from, from me personally. What about you, Simon? What are you the most proud of, like the, 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 um... the project? It's hard because it's so different, but uh, one of the projects is with Lufthansa, where we challenge people to change their name for the chance of winning a new life in Berlin, and 43 Swedes legally changed their names to Klaus Heidi to have that opportunity. This also won a lot of awards uh, internationally, uh, but I've also done some work with my, actually my favorite sports club, AIK in Sweden, both when it comes to lobbying and crisis communications, but also creative campaigning. Three, uh, two, one, out of time. No, sorry, you, you can finish. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's that, so I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you so much.